Uh, you're a Felicia. Say, hey, let's stand and pray. Let us stand and pray. Oh, thank you. My girl. We're going to set this. So I want you to just consider that in your own prayer time that am I approaching God as if he's coming? Am I approaching God? You can close. I just, just the comment section is what we want up. So that way, in case, but nobody should be on there, but just in case. <laughs> So we don't ever want to treat God as common. Amen. So that's why when I approach God, I approach him as though I need him and not as though he's in need of me. When I pray from a position of, when I pray, excuse me, from a position of sitting, it's as if he needs me and he does not. When I kneel, it's because I need him and it's about him. You understand? And. If you've never broken your flesh, you don't have a good chance at being used by God. Because praying on your knees hurts. Your ankles fall asleep, your knees hurt. It's not <laughs> the most fun position to be in, actually. Right? And if you've never broken your flesh, you restrict the ability to be used by God. So God may need you to pray for an hour for someone, but if you can only pray on your knees for two minutes. That ability may be hindered. You get what I'm saying? Meaning the life source to flow from you is best flowed through a man that's broken. So I spent time breaking myself and being broken before God also. That's where all the fasting comes in. That's why we're on our knees before him and all those things. Amen. So I wanted to share that, that bit because I know we were praying standing up. But you need to know it's honorable before the Lord God to pray on your knees. It's accepted before him because he is our king. Amen. Amen. Now, there's nothing we can do to stop the dog from barking because she knows we're all up here. So <laughs> forgive us in advance. And we're trying new. What'd you say? Oh, yeah. And this is in our home, too. So that's kind of like <laughs> what goes with par for the course. So you'll see our children walking through here. You hear our dog barking. Hopefully the doorbell doesn't ring up with the Amazon driver because right? the package was supposed to come in is late. So he may ring the doorbell while we teach him. But this is in our home. So what better place than to just be authentic, right? Amen. But I told you all last week, I said, we're going to talk about life and death when we get back together. And that's what we're going to talk about. And it's something that's, you know, you're going to die and you know you're living. But what happens when you die? Most people are uncertain. Most people aren't aware. We have a general idea, right? We have a general idea like, man, we'll go to heaven or hell. <laughs> That's kind of like, there is no in-betweens. However, there are some other dynamics that most times we're not aware of. And that's where we're going to go through a couple of different scriptures to look at life, to look at death, and even what happens in the life to come. Because remember, like the old saints sometimes say, we live and live again. Your desire and your life pursuits needs to be that I am living so that I can live again. God so loved the word that he gave his only son that whosoever believe in him could have eternal life. But the life you live may not be as eternal as you think if you do not have it right with him. You understand? Yeah. All right. God created us in his likeness and in his image. That's <coughs> eternal in nature. So you were created with eternity in your heart. Or as the word of God says, he's placed eternity in the hearts of every man. So eternity is already placed inside of you. The desire to be with him is already placed inside of you. But how you live determines where you will be. Right. And him being eternal, my desire to be with him, because that was the way we were created in his image and in his likeness. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about. How do we live this life in a way that we can be with him forever? Right. Remember, there were two men on the cross with Jesus. And one had a harsh disposition towards Jesus and the other one didn't. And the one who did not, the one that didn't, the one who was softer towards the Lord Jesus, he said, tonight you're going to come, you're going to be with me in paradise. But he was already being crucified, so he was already preparing to die, which lets us know that man can live a certain way and God is willing to accept him all the way up until that point if he's willing to turn to the Lord Jesus. Despite what we've heard contrary to proper belief, God is full of mercy, full of compassion. You always hear me say that. God is full of mercy, full of compassion, rich in his love towards us, that if a man would turn, he would accept him. Amen. Excellent. 
So let's look at, um, let's go to uh, John 3 and 13. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'll go there while we turn it off. So. And while while we're going there, John, can you do me a favor? Can you find me where in Kings is it that talks about Elijah was taken up into a whirlwind? Which scripture exactly? Soft hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you find it, John? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna look for it while you're doing it. Thank God for the World Wide Web. All right, so let's 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 backtrack. We're gonna go to Second Kings first, two and one. And we're gonna talk about <clears throat> excuse me, we're gonna first talk about Elijah. Now, if you don't know about Elijah, most do though, but Elijah was a servant of God, he was a prophet of God. And Elijah lived a life in such a way that at a certain point he was taken to be with God. And in doing so, him being taken to be with God, we see that it's possible for a man to live in such a way that God would take him. Even when we look at Enoch, it says that Enoch had the testimony that he pleased God, that he walked with God until he was no more. And so we'll, we'll go through that passage of scripture also. But the reason Elijah and Enoch are important is because these men walk with God. And in their walking with God, they begin to grow with God. And as they grew with God, they begin to know God. And when you begin to know God, you begin to learn about his nature and about his character and about his ways. And as you master those things, you move into the secret things of God. The word of God says that the secret things, those things which belong to the Lord or those secret things which belong to the Lord God, those things that are revealed to us and to our children. So there are secret things that belong to God that and a secret is a secret for a reason. The reason is a secret is because everybody doesn't know, which means that. There are certain things that are with God that we are all not privy to. So you have to imagine how many times when we see men of God or other things move with something, perhaps there's something that they know that we don't. So we quickly judge sometimes not realizing that perhaps they have information that we don't have. When you look at the life of Elijah and Enoch, that was the case. Elijah and Enoch both had secrets with God. And that was the cause that caused him to be taken. So the way I've heard a wonderful man of God say it, he said that within the scripture, there's seven layers of revelation. By the time you get to the seventh one, he said, God going to come take you himself. Right. Which means that there's depth and there's layers in God. And when you look at the past men of God that God used, the saints of old, as I call it, each one of them had certain things that they moved with, that they operated with, that we sometimes, if we see it, we, we'll say all kind of stuff about them, especially the prophets of old, right? We were talking about it last week with St. Patrick, especially because we were out last night having dinner. We saw everybody downtown in their green and all that stuff. Y'all probably been seeing it because St. Patrick is coming up, like, I think this Friday. But even in St. Patrick, <clears throat> most people didn't know St. Patrick was a man of God. He was a prophet and he was an apostle. Most people have no clue. We just know the holiday where people need to have green on and they want to drink beer and do other foolish things. But that wasn't really what it was about. St. Patrick was a prophet of God. You didn't know that, did you? St. Patrick was deep. St. Patrick is the reason Ireland doesn't have any snakes to this day. So what happened was, and if you, when you really study life of St. Patrick, what happened was he was captured by pirates in his early years. When he was captured by pirates, they brought him to Ireland for slavery. When he finally escaped, he heard the people calling him to come back and freedom. 
and not freedom in the sense of captivity, but freedom with the gospel. And his life's mission was the people of Ireland. And he went back as a free man. And that's where he lived his life, preaching the gospel, working amongst the church. That's where the three leaf clover comes about. So when you talk about the green, that was one of the ways he explained the triune nature of God. One person, three expressions, each unique in its expression, one being triune in nature. God gave him the understanding of that with the three leaf clover or the shamrock, whatever you want to call it. That's where St. Patrick got that from. So that's what, that's the problem. So what happens is people, God will give somebody something and people will try to duplicate not understanding that God gave that thing to them. So St. Patrick Day was never about liquor. So even with the snakes, what happened was a young man got bit and they told, told Patrick about it. Patrick, he said, bring the snake to me. He takes him to the highest point in Ireland. He holds the snakes up. He calls all the other snakes to himself and he banishes them from the region. And there's never been another snake to this day in Ireland. Now scientists would try to disprove him and say every other thing, like, oh, well, the climate and this, that, and the other, this, that, and the other. But as we all know, they tried to disprove Jesus. So at this point, I'm really not interested in what they have to say concerning it. I don't even know what to do because I never celebrated it. I can't even tell you where the leprechauns came from. Yeah, so, I mean, two different things, but the real purpose in it is that we have to understand that men of God have always moved with things that aren't open to the naked eye. So even when you look at Watchman Nee, it's one of my favorite saints. Watchman Nee was a prophet also. There were certain things he navigated and maneuvered with that everyone else didn't have public information to. But what's happened is, as people get access to certain things, they take that and then they make a doctrine out of it or they make other things out of it. And that's how you get all these years later, we see people with green, drinking beer, turn, turning into something that it would never was. We see that even amongst the church. Not to that measure of the spectrum of living a life of vow like that, but we even see that amongst the church where something God did at one point in time that will they hold to and never be willing to move from or take it and morph it into something that it was never created to be. You understand that? So even with that, with every man of God, God has given them secrets that they operate and function with him. That was Elijah and Enoch. God gave them certain things to move with and to operate with. But like St. Patrick, if people don't have an understanding, they will take it and make it about beer. <laughs> right. And it never had any, it never had anything to do with that. Amen. Yeah. Excellent. And that's the thing. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us. That was the key with Samson. So Samson was strong, and we think he was strong because of his hair. No. Samson's secret is what made him strong. The moment he gave his secret up, he lost his strength. Remember, there were plenty of the Nazarites that had long hair. Jesus being a Nazarite. And our Lord and Savior, but he even, even our Lord Jesus did not possess the strength of Samson. So it wasn't about the hair. The hair was an outward expression of an inward secret. And when he gave that secret up, he lost his strength. You see that? So God gives men things, God gives men of God things to walk with. But the moment we begin to expose our hand, that's the moment you could possibly lose your strength. You see that? And that's the key. Samson wasn't big, Samson wasn't what the movies make it. That's the key. That's the part you have done. I remember when I, I shared this with my wife, maybe four, five weeks ago, whenever, and I told her, I said, well, you know, Samson wasn't what the movies say. The movies portray him. And also keep in mind, I've never watched any Christian movies except for like The Prince of Egypt. Because <laughs> I watch it with, I watch that with the children. Deliver us. <laughs> we like that soundtrack, right? <laughs> the soundtrack is fire. But I've never watched any outside of that Passion of the Christ. I've never seen none of that stuff. Because I've had my own experience with God where he's brought me through the scriptures and I've been able to see a lot of things. Not everything, but I've been able to see enough. And that's why I learned about Samson. So Samson wasn't brolic like our brother. Samson was more built like you. You see the difference? 
we assume Samson was built like y'all. Samson was built like you. That's what made the measure of his strength such an awe. There were plenty of people before. They understood giants. They understood all these different things. So strength wasn't something new. The awe factor was that how could someone of this size possess the strength of an individual like that? That's why every time he did something, he said the spirit of the Lord would come upon him. Because clearly he can't do that. You see that? That's what made, it was within that secret. That's what made him strong. Not just with them possessing hair. The moment he exposed his hand, you're done for. Wow. Amen. Excellent. So that was that's a lot of like Elijah and Enoch. They walk with God in a manner and learn certain things, and in learning certain things, they were taken out of here. Right. Amen. So let's look at a uh, Second Kings. Which one did we say? One. One. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Terry, here I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. I'm sorry, that's 2 Kings 2, verse 1. I apologize. It's 2 Kings 2 and 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Terry, here I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And then as we skip further down to verse 12, and Elisha saw, or excuse me, verse 11, and it came to pass that they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and partnered them asunder, and parted them asunder, excuse me. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. So we see here Elijah's one of the first people outside of Enoch to get taken away, right? All right, now let's look at Enoch. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. And we're going to do five through six. John, if you could help me with that. Hebrews 11, five and six. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a reward, reward, rewarder yes. of those who diligently seek him. Excellent. So we see by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not what? See death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, the question we have to ask is, the word of God says that no man has ascended into heaven except the son of man first ascend. Jesus had yet to be glorified. Jesus had yet to even come into the earth when these two men were taken up. But Jesus said, no man has ascended into heaven. So where did these two go? Because it says they went into heaven. All right? So this gives us the first understanding that there's more to the heavens than what we understand. There's more than what we just gener generically read. Even within the heavens, he said that he said the stars, there's lights within the what? Heaven. Which means that that first heaven is not the heaven that we're talking about. Amen? So let's go to John 3 and 13 and we'll start putting this thing together. So 
like my uh, my Bible app is glitching. All right, so let's start at verse one, actually. Ashley, can you help me out and read it? You got it? Do you want me to read it? Yeah, one, and we're going to go to one through 13. It was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, mm-hmm. a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. Mm-hmm. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit. Yes. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And do you not and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from the heaven, that is the Son of Man who is it, who is in heaven. Excellent. So we go back to verse 12. He says, If I told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can I tell you heavenly things? I felt that. You felt that, right? If I've told you earthly things and you can't even grasp or comprehend or understand that, how can I tell you heavenly things or spiritual things? Mm-hmm. Remember he said, hey, there's things I desire to tell you, but even you can't bear it. So that means that we have to have a certain measure of comprehension for earthly things before we can have a certain measure of comprehension for spiritual things. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then when we go down to 13, and no man hath ascended up to where? Heaven. But he that come down from heaven, even the son of man, which is where in heaven. Now, Jesus is saying this on the earth, but he's saying that the son of man is currently in heaven. So that's kind of a wait a minute. What's going on here? And I'm going to kind of help break some of this down. What you have to understand about man is that man exists in three planes. All at the same time. Now, remember, if you can't understand earthly things, even though I'm saying this, it will just fly right over your head. Ask God for wisdom, understanding, so you can receive revelation. Mm-hmm. Amen. But man exists between three realms. That's why Jesus said that. You good. <laughs> That's why Jesus said that no one has ascended except the Son of Man who first ascended, except the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Jesus said this, and he had yet to be crucified or glorified. But he told him that the Son of Man is in heaven. But then when you go further up in the discourse, when she first started reading, he said that no man can be born back into his mother's womb a second time. So what are you speaking about, Lord? And that's when he said, except a man be born again. That's what he's talking about. But that born again means born from above. But he was on the earth. So if he's existing here, having a physical conversation with Jesus, and Jesus says that you have to be born from above That means when the transaction happens, the you that's here got replaced with the one that was there. No man can enter the womb a second time. But Jesus said that except you be born again, which means to be born from above. But you're here. So if you're here and you're born from above, that means the you that came has replaced you that's here. You understand that? I'm helping you understand spiritual things that man exists in more than one place. So the TV and the Marvels and all that thing, the concepts are right. Is the spiritual dynamics off? Yes. But in theory, what's happening, it's there. Okay? Excellent. So I wanted to get that. So let's go to, uh, let's go to Ephesians 4. I'm going to have to use old school Bible today. My, uh, 
My Bible lap ain't kicking it like it's supposed to. Chris, help me with this. Let's do... Let's do seven. No, let's do eight through ten. Yes. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heaven, that he might fill all things. Excellent. So now it says what? He ascended on high and he did what? He led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. The gifts to men are for us. Those gifts to men are what? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So if someone's not connected to one of those things, you're lacking in the gifts. But Jesus said that he gave them to you. So you need to question where you are because Jesus said, those who I died for, I gave them apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Well, so I don't even get into the arguments. I don't believe in prophets. I don't. Well, you just don't believe in what Jesus gave you. But Jesus is the person that you don't get to reject his gifts and partake of him. You got to take the whole scroll. You don't get to take portion of it. You take the whole thing. <laughs> She's starting already. <laughs> She's starting already. <laughs> Right. But Jesus is the one that you have to take the whole scroll. You don't get to take a piece of it. So I don't know about it. You know, I used to back in college, that used to be one of the arguments with some of our peer group. Well, there's no, you know, there are no more apostles. And I was like, okay, well, that sounds pretty dumb. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I wasn't willing to contend with it because contention only comes by pride. Mm -hmm. So I just leave people right where they are when they want to have those kind of arguments. I'm like, amen, buddy. We'll just find out in the life to come. I'm just not willing to miss out on every gift God gave me. Mm -hmm. Amen. So it says that he ascended on high. He led captivity captives and then he gave gifts to men. And then in the next verse, he that descended. Now, Jesus is the one that descended. Now, he that ascended, excuse me. What is but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? So now we're talking about what Jesus did when he was crucified, buried and resurrected. During that process, there were some other things that took place while he was in the grave. And this is what this is talking about. So remember, I said man exists in different realms. Jesus was in the grave, but while he was in the grave, he was ransacking hell also. So now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is also the same that ascended up far above what? All heavens that he might fill all things. And as other, other translation says, he sent it far above all the heavens, which lets us know that there's more than one heaven. Amen. You understand that? So when it talks about Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind into heaven, the heaven that Jesus ascended above is not the same heaven that Elijah was taken into. When it says Elijah was taken up into a whirlwind into heaven, it's talking about that first heaven, meaning beyond what we could see. But it's not that oh, he was taken up into heaven before God. You understand that? Because no man has entered heaven until Jesus had ascended. No man. So Jesus didn't have his words messed up when he said, no man has ascended except first the son of man. So now we have to say, where were they at? Where did they go? Amen. Excellent. We're going to figure it out. So let's go to... Um, Let's go to 1 Samuel 28 and 7. So even in that, when you read some of the scholars' writings and you listen to some of the people, they say, well, there's three, the three heavens. I want you to know there's more than three heavens. Samuel 28 and 7. Yeah, 1 Samuel 28 verse 7. There's three heavens that we can read explicitly about. But remember, Jesus said, I'm trying to tell you earthly things. You can't even get it. There's no way you're going to understand spiritual things. 
You understand? That's what Paul said. Paul said, I know a man, whether in the flesh or spirit, I cannot understand or comprehend, but he was caught up into the third heaven. So we took that and said, that is the end all for the heavens. Mm -hmm. And we put that concrete lid on it as if God can't move without the bounds of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. God will never contradict the scriptures. Right. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that that which which isn't expressly written is not experienced and true. Mm -hmm. You understand? So even Paul says that he was caught up into the third heaven and a verse before it talked about how at another time he was also caught up into paradise. Which means paradise and heaven are not the same thing. But that's how it's preached. Oh, par oh right. we'll see you in paradise. Paradise and heaven clearly are not the same thing. Jesus told the man on the cross, tonight you're going to come and you're going to dine with me. You're going to have dinner with me in paradise. Jesus had yet to ascend. So where was he going to meet the gentleman at? You see that? Excellent. Okay, so first Samuel twenty eight seven. I'm gonna try a new Bible, but this ain't working. What'd you say? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. First uh, Samuel. I'm sorry, I'm having to switch Bibles. This other one's not working. Jacob, help me with this. Let's read verse 3. Actually, I'll do this one because this is a longer one. I don't want to trip nobody up. Everybody good? They got it? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now Samuel had died and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah. So Samuel has just been what? Buried. Okay. I want us to remember that. Israel is lamenting for him and he's been what? Buried in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. So now Saul is trying to interact with God. God's not interacting with him. Our interactions with God are based upon his doing, not ours. We can initiate a transaction, but if he chooses not to, he chooses not to. But this shows us that Saul knew different measures and different ways by which he could interact with God. And these ways he learned from Samuel. Samuel taught him different things of the prophetic. So when it says that he sought God by a dream, this means this isn't the same dream that when you just lay down and go to sleep and whatever. So happenstance happens. This is a prophetic and a spiritual encounter that he's trying to now go back into, but he can't go back into because it's cut off from him. And the prophets are no longer dealing with him. So if you dishonor the head of the prophets, the rest of them won't speak to you. That's the key. I try to, I try to air and keep people always out of dishonor because it's a spiritual protocol. If you dishonor authority, if you dishonor leadership, God will cut you off. And, and you're not aware of it. It's a spiritual law, no matter how much you try to get out of it. Kind of like, thou should not dishonor thy mother and thy father so that thy days may be long on the earth. If you dishonor your mother and your father and they curse you, there's nothing I can do to help you. There's nothing Jesus can do to help you until you make it right. Because a curse without a cause cannot stand, is what the word of God says. But if your father or your mother curses you, there's nothing you can do about it. Why? Because of the dishonor. So dishonoring leadership is one of the things that I'm opposed of. I'm opposed to even talking about men of God. I don't even go down that route. Even if I disagree in my heart and I know I just... I won't say it openly unless God has given me a specific task to call this person out, which he has not. I just choose not to because I, too, have been ignorant. I, too, have been in need of mercy. I, too, have been in need of covering. So I just choose not to air that way. And if we're all on the same team, 
I just choose not to strike myself in the face. If we're all of the same body. Now, if they're not of the body, that's a different thing. Because we see the Apostle Paul said, that. he said, hey, mark these individuals. They brought me much harm. They did this. They did that. So forth. So on. So there's a time for it. But what I'm saying is most times when people are being called out, it's not the time for it. That's the time for somebody walking with you. And you need to clean up your camp. Hey, mark them. But amongst the church as a whole, you're not even walking with that person. What, what you got to say matter? You want to speak about a national voice, but you don't even have a national voice. So that's like what happened with T.D. Jakes, right? Do we all think T.D. Jakes could use some help doing deliverance? Probably so. Probably so. What T.D. Jakes said, stand up and look at the man of God, right? <laughs> right? We get into ministrations, though, right? Like how, how somebody does something. So how I've ministered, how I've worked in the gift of miracles is different from how some of my brothers work in the gift of miracles. We got two different ministrations, same gift. So I, just, I didn't even get up in the theatrics of it, but the church was in an uproar. And rather than helping them, they decided to mock them. Mm. And I remember saying that to one of my sisters. She's like, oh, the devil didn't come out. I said, how you know? Mm. I said, that's the measure which you walk in that you think the person has to roll over, flop, manifest, and you got to say come up and out a hundred times. Yeah. There's a greater measure that perhaps you don't know. <laughs> right but that's the thing and i'm just using td jakes an example i don't know him personally he don't have a clue who i am right but the idea that people think that they can dishonor and never see so you want to dishonor him but you want to receive grace to multiply and grow to the measure that he did i don't quite see that happening that way i say you want to dishonor but then you want to receive the same grace that he has to grow and multiply in which he has done now, obviously, there's a certain level of business that comes along with that. You get a certain amount. You can scale and those kind of things. So I'm not dis acknowledging that side of things, but it doesn't change the fact that God adds to his church. And he plants them where he sees fit. So God thought fit for a lot of them to be over there. And so I've always been a fan of honor, grace, honor where you want to go. So I've always honored the men of God. I honor my spiritual father. I honor the men of old. I honor the saints of old. Right? Because you don't get to receive what you don't honor. That's the way I learned it. I'll tell you how I learned that. But you don't get to receive what you dishonor. <coughs> but we got there from Saul because Saul dishonored Samuel. Rather than Saul receiving the correction, because remember this whole discourse excuse me, <coughs> was because Saul was instructed by Samuel to do a certain thing. And Samuel chose to do it a different way. But in doing it a different way, when Samuel came out to correct him, he wanted, hey, go sit down, man, not right now. And Samuel said, oh, okay. You, you big now. Got it. You're done. You're done. So that's why I don't dishonor leadership, because in a haste of a moment, you can lose everything that God has planned for you. You understand that that fast the kingdom was gone from. Him. You understand? So he's consulting by dreams, by the Urim and by the prophets and none of which he can get an answer. Then Saul said to his servants, find me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. So, you know, he's down bad at this point. He's like, hey, man, I need you to go find a witch doctor because I'm down bad. <laughs> I'm down bad. And his servant said to him, in fact, there is a woman who was at who was a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes. And he went and two men with him and they came to the woman by night. And he said, please conduct the seance for me and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, look, you know what Saul has done. Now, remember, mind you, he's disguised himself to an extent. So she she's not aware that it's him at the moment. You know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life and cause me to die? And, swore, and Saul excuse me, swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. And then the woman said, Who shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, what is his form? 
Now, remember, when we first read this, it said that he was buried in Ramah. But right here saying that I see a spirit come out of the earth. And he says, what is his form? Remember, I told you man exists in three planes. His first man is already in the ground. So now we're seeing another plane of another place of existence. You understand that? So he's coming out of the ground. What is his form is what he said to her. And she said, an old man is coming up and he is covered with a mantle. Well, if he's in the ground and his body's in the ground. And she said, I see his form in his spirit, which means there was spiritual clothing that he also had. You see that? Because she said, I see his form. He's an old man and he's wearing a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now, Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me where? Up. I want you to pay attention to the language. So she brought him where? Not down. You sure? The word of God says she brought him where? Up. All right. And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed for the Philistines make war against me. And God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel says, so why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. So you see that here he says, why are you asking me, seeing though the Lord has departed from you? So what he's telling him is that the instructions that I possess, I can't give to you because God is no longer with you. Which means the prophet had the ability or within him the capability to give instructions if God was still with him. You understand? Within him, he had the ability to give instructions if God was still with Samuel. But he says, seeing as though God is against you, there's nothing I can do for you. And then he goes down to verse 18, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath among Amalekek, Amalek, excuse me. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hands of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. You see that? Tomorrow you and your sons are going to be where? With me. There's other translations you have to read. Tomorrow you and your son will be with me in paradise. Which lets us know where was he dwelling at that Samuel, well, where was Samuel dwelling at that Saul and his sons were now coming to be with him also? But she said she called him where? Up. Not down. She called him up. And then he said, tomorrow you coming down to be with me too. But Samuel was a righteous man, so Samuel did not go to hell. Which means we have to ask ourselves, where is paradise truly at? You understand? Where's paradise at? Because she said, I went and called him up. Samuel said, why have you called me up? He said, tomorrow you're going to come be with me in paradise. Okay. All right. Now let's go look at Lazarus. That's uh, Luke 16. I have a question. Mm-hmm. About the mediums and stuff. Yes. That's the same? It's a real thing. I mean, I know. I mean, we heard talk about it before. If he was a man, why is he going to them? Because the prophets could no longer, he had no, no longer had access to the prophets. Mm-hmm. Because he was so cut off. Is it a bad thing or is it not a bad thing? It's a bad thing. It's something that you don't try to I'm find out. It's a bad thing. That's why they were all put out of the land. That's why they had to search for them. So Remember? it's not bad that he went to them? That's no, bad. He had no business doing that. But he was down bad and in dire straits. So he had no other choice. Does he need to repent for that? Or anything? Oh, yeah. I'm just asking. Well, I don't even. <laughs> well, I mean, Samuel had already told him, tomorrow you're going to come be with me. Yeah. So this this is not about to be a long encounter anyway. Uh-huh. Samuel already told him, tomorrow you need to prepare yourself. You and your son, y'all finna die. Uh-huh. That's what happened. So he went, he called him up. And he said, hey, guess what? Good news for you. Tomorrow you and your son finna die. Uh-huh. So just get your house together. And then the next day you see they died in battle. The next day you see them died in battle. So the word of the Lord is still true. But we don't deal in that realm. And the reason we don't deal in that realm is because God has given us prophets. Mm-hmm. Believe in his prophets, you shall be established. Believe in the Lord your God, you shall be established. Believe in his prophets and you will prosper. Mm-hmm. Right? The word of the Lord with the prophets, and that's what we talked about the last time, 
Remember, the prophets had the solution. The woman, the, the medium at the indoor couldn't tell him nothing except for do her little conduction that she did. Yeah. Samuel had the solution. Hey, you finna die tomorrow. You're going to come be with me in paradise. <laughs> you get it? Excellent. So let's look at uh, Luke 16 and 24. Thank you, Lord. Joe, help me out with this one. Um, let's start at verse 19 and go to. You go to 24 and then I'll pick up at 25. Yes, sir. Just to help kind of carry some of that load. Thank you. The rich man last. Yeah. The rich man and last. Everybody good? They got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off. And okay, all right, so stop there. He was where? But he lifted his eyes and he saw who? Abraham. All right. Remember, the word of God is spiritual. You have to savor it. If you just read it, you just, if you read it on fast forward, that's the level of measure of revelation that you're going to get. That's the level of understanding you're going to get. I'm not saying you have to read like extremely slow, but take your time when it says, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on all back up. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So when the beggar died, how did he get into Abraham's bosom? The angels carried him. But you see, I guarantee you none of us caught that in that moment because it happened so fast, right? Right? Did that? I, you don't count. <laughs> I already taught you. <laughs> but everyone else, it happened, right? Meaning how much are we missing within the word of God? How much richness and depth are we missing when we just... Take the time and savor it. Amen? Amen. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes. So the rich man was in hell and he lift up his eyes, being in torment and seeing Abraham and see if Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So the rich man that died went where? He went to hell. The beggar went where? Abraham's bosom. And he was able to see, the rich man was able to see the beggar from where he was. Okay? I want you to remember that. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. So not only can he see him, but he can speak to him. Have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, remember, Jesus said that you need to fear the one who can not only destroy the body, but can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. This man had already died, but he's telling them how tormented he is, which means his body that was in that other realm like we're talking about is feeling every piece of this. You understand? I'm sorry, my uh, thing flip pages. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Now, you, you see the difference as I'm reading it? Mm -hmm. Always take your time and read the word of God in such manner. So you can receive everything God has for you. That he may dip his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said... Which means now what? Abraham can also speak back to him. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. 
What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? Right? Remember that. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So now he's telling them, I can speak to you and you can speak to me. But even if I wanted to help you, son, there's a great distance between you and me. You can't come here and I can't come to you. Which means paradise and hell will parallel to one another. Both. That's why he said there's a great gulf fixed between you and me. Abraham's bosom was the place where the righteous would go that God had prepared for them to be that God had prepared for them to be preserved until the day that Jesus would ascend and take every man back to heaven. So literally paradise was almost the best way I could describe it because I learned this without the scriptures. The best way I could describe it is if you had a top floor and a bottom floor and one couldn't access the other, but they're in the same house. You understand? Or if you took a football field and you cut it in the middle at the 50 yard line and you put a distance in between the two and they didn't have the ability to cross over. One was on one side and one was on the other. That's what hell and paradise was. So all of the righteous who died in faith, all of those went and were carried into Abraham's bosom. All of those who did not die in that manner were carried and tormented in hell. This is why the language is important. This is why they would say things like, hey, why did you call me up? Because he was coming out of the earth. He said, I see spirits coming out of the earth. Remember the witch said that. I see spirits coming out of the earth. That was what was happening. Paradise and hell were parallel to one another in the same place. But Abraham's bosom is how God preserved his people. Is it the same thing now? No. It's no longer the same because Jesus has ascended. And when he ascended, every man followed and entered into heaven. Amen? Amen. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father. Now he's calling him Father, but he wasn't Father back then. <laughs> because if Abraham was your father, you would do the works of Abraham. Remember Jesus said that. Those who have Abraham do the works of Abraham. He's calling him father. That thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest, thou, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now you have to ask yourself, he's asking him to send who where? He said, then he said, I pray thee therefore, father, that thou would send him to my father's house. Well, how's he going to send him if he's already in paradise? But if you start dealing with the saints, they say, oh, that's necromancy. <laughs> you worshiping the dead. <laughs> no, there's a certain measure that you don't know. God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. You understand? Excellent. For I have five brethren that he may testify to them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. How did they have Moses and the prophets? Moses died a long time ago. Which means there's more than what we understand. And he said, nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will <laughs> repent. <laughs> but if we say, if one of them came from the dead, that's witchcraft. That's necromancy. Now, there was a gentleman some years ago, and he... He he got a bad rep and I hated it for him. He was one of the most gifted people we had seen in some years come onto the prophetic scene. And he had a certain understanding that everyone wasn't ready for. And so because of that, when he prophesied, he would talk about saying to it past, hey, I see your father who passed on and he's wanting me to tell you this. And everyone... He's a wizard. That's witchcraft. That's necromancy. He's worshiping the dead. All everyone. People I know personally. Amen. Now I just shut my mouth and don't say nothing until it's my place. Right? So it wasn't my place to say anything. But he said it right here. Abraham said unto them, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, nay, father. But if one went unto them from the dead, they would listen. Which means he understood that they had the ability to move between realms. 
He clearly said it. If one of them went from the dead, they would listen, which means the bounds that we understand, they understood in a different way. Remember, I said man exists in different planes. Man exists in the flesh. Man exists in the spirit. Man exists in the soul. And each one is a unique, distinct expression, just like that chamrock, but all one at the same time. And he said to them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. But we would say, hey, man, that's impossible. Not only is it possible, that's witchcraft. That's necromancy. You worship in the dead. <laughs> yeah, familiar spirits. No, it's familiar spirits for those who died and are not in Christ. Those who died in righteousness and faith, they went on to be in Abraham's bosom. You understand? Excellent. So let's look at Luke 22. Luke 22. <laughs> Actually, let's go to. Mm, hold on, let me. And scroll through the summons here. Let's go to 23. And we'll go down to verse 40. Mm. Actually, let's... Let's go to 32. Janika, can you help me with this one? Let's do Luke 23, 32, but we're going to go through 32 through um, 32 through 38, and I'll pick up from there. So I'll do the rest after you get to 38. But I have prayed for you that your faith Shall not fail. Hold on, which one are you at? Uh, you at 23? Oh, okay, let's go 23, 32. I said 22 the first time. That was a mistake. Okay, I the, the king on the cross. Yep, uh, there were also two others on verse 32. Okay, there, we go. there were also two others, criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Yes. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Excellent. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, excuse me, but the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man have done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Or oh, surely I say to you, today you will be with me in where? Paradise. Paradise. Now we all understand that Jesus had to die. He was crucified, put into the grave, and then he resurrected. But he told him, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Remember, man dwells in three different realms. Jesus hung on the cross and died. It said that he gave up the ghost. Meaning the physical was gone out of there. But he told him, today, you're going to be with me and we're going to dine together in paradise. You understand? Which means paradise was a gulf 
paradise was on the other in, on the other side of that gulf fixed between hell. Because in the other scripture we read, it says that Jesus had the first to descend into the lower parts of the earth. They're talking about hell when they say he had to go into the lower parts of the earth. You see that? Now it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened and the veil was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last breath. So when the Sertorian saw that this happened, he said he glorified God, saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Now, even in this, Jesus said, no man can take my life except I give it. No man can take my life. His life was taken by virtue of being there. But if he doesn't willingly cooperate, Jesus ain't dying. Just physically, if he doesn't give up his spirit, it's not happening. He would have stayed on that cross and just would have been a man with no blood and no water and just would have still been living because he was the God man. You understand? Mm -hmm. Who else was like that? Moses. Y'all didn't know that. God had to tell Moses to die. Remember Moses, he said, I will make, un make you unto Pharaoh like God and Aaron will be your prophet. Mm -hmm. Moses, God had to tell him, okay, Moses, listen, it's time for you to die. You need to go over on the Mount Nebo and give up your spirit. Which means Moses would have still been living today if God didn't tell him, hey, you need to give it up. Hey, man, let's let's go there. Uh, that's Deuteronomy 38, Deuteronomy 31, 14. Uh, Deuteronomy 31 and 14. So Moses tapped into something that we don't understand. Moses understood that death can be postponed. He understood that death could be postponed. We see that with the prophet and Hezekiah. I was it. Who was it? Was it Isaiah? Who was it that went to the prophet and then he turned to the wall? I think it was Isaiah. But either way, Hezekiah gets the word from the prophet. And then the prophet says, prepare your house. You finna die. And then he leaves. As he's leaving, Hezekiah turns his face to the wall, prays to God. God tells him, go back and tell him I've added this many years to his life. I've extended his life. Which means that death can be postponed. Hezekiah understood that. Hezekiah prayed to God. But even in that, God was taking Hezekiah not because of any fault of his own. God was taking Hezekiah because he did not want his son to be born. He knew his son was a wicked man, would be a wicked man. And he was trying to prevent it from happening. But Hezekiah turned to the wall, sought the mercies of God, and he received it. And the prophet went back into the chamber and said, God is extending your life. That was a story with my father. When my father was ready to leave, there was nothing that anyone could do to stop it. There was no machine that you could hook up to him. There was nothing you could do to stop it. And he said, he said, I'm done fighting. There's another prophet I know. And when her father was on his sickbed, she had to bring all the family together. When she brought all the family together, she said, I refuse to see my father in his way. And he called for her, like, no, she needs to come see me. And when she came in, he said, why are you doing this to me? And she said, what are you talking about? He said, you know I'm ready to go home. Why won't you let me go? If you let me go, I'll leave. And then she had an argument with him on the deathbed. And then said, you can leave when I get back home. And when she flew back out of town, he passed away. There's deeper connections than what we understand. And that's how I told my mother, I said, Mom, you have to let him go. This is what it was. So death can even be postponed in, to a certain measure, to a certain degree. Enoch found that out. He walked with God in such a measure that death got postponed and he just got taken up. That should be our desire that we walk with God in such a measure, in such a way that he would long to be with us just as much as we long to be with him. Amen? He's like, yeah. <laughs> and that's part of it. I mean, I've had that happen where people people call because something's happening. And I, I mean, one time it's like, hey, God's going to keep this person. There's been other times where people call, like, hey, man, what's going on? And I've had to tell them, 
God's preparing to take him home. You need to get ready. That's the part that's not fun. Oh, that's right. I forgot about you. I wasn't even talking about you. I forgot. I told you too. It's time for him to die. You need to get your get your house together. This is what's happening. And believe it or not, this is what pleases God in this moment. Amen. Deuteronomy uh, thirty-one and fourteen. Actually, uh, I gotta go old school. My uh, my Bible drink glitch. Everybody good? Deuteronomy thirty-one. Uh, Fourteen. Read that for me, Ashley, and I'm gonna get the next one. <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, "Until mm-hmm. the days approach when you must die, call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of meeting, that I may inaugurate him." So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of meeting. Now the Lord appeared at the tabernacle in a pillar, cl- in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, "Behold." You will rest with your fathers, and these and this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land. All right, that's perfect. And then I'm going to jump into 40 or 50. Then, then the Lord spake to Moses that very same day, saying, Go up to this mountain of Abarim, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, across from Jericho. View the land of Canaan, which I give to the children of Israel as a possession, and die on that mountain which you ascend. And be gathered to your people just as Aaron, your brother, died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. God had to tell him to go die. God said, go up on the mountain. I want you to look at the promised land because you're not going. Give up your spirit and come on to be with me. <laughs> you see that? Y'all didn't even know that about Moses. <laughs> Moses was walking different. Remember, he said, I will make him like God. Moses had to be told to die. Which means there's more to life than what we understand. You get what I'm saying? And Moses was different. Moses was so different, Satan tried to get his body. You know that, huh? That's in, that's in Jude. Jude is a, a one chapter book, so you literally can read it. It's two pages long. You literally read it. But even when you read Jude, it says that Satan was contending against Michael for the body of Moses. Because <laughs> he knew, hey, Moses got some special stuff up in there, man. I need to, uh, I need to get a little piece of that right there. <laughs> I need to get a little piece of that. <laughs> Excellent. Let's go to Hebrews 11. Uh, let's go to 25. Hold on, let me, let's skip down a little more. By faith, this is the whole faith hall of fame, as they call it, right? By faith, the hall of Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, work righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword out of weaknesses, were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still, others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and in caves of the earth. 
and all of these having attained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Now we go back to verse 38. It talks about how they were stoned, how they were sawn in half. Sawn meaning cut in half. How they were stoned, sawn, slain, every other thing that they suffered. And it says the world was not worthy to have these individuals. But you live your life as though the world is worthy to have you. You have to ask yourself, is the world worthy to have me? What about my life will cause the world to reject me? What about my life will cause the world to say he should not be here? But yet the worldly gladly receives you. Jesus said, hey, man, they hated me. They're going to hate you also. But yet you look around and the world is celebrating you, cheering you on, and they love you. It's proof that you're not like these individuals who the world is not worthy to have. And you have to do some reconciling in your own heart and in your own soul. Am I saying be eager to be sawn in half? No. Am I saying be eager to be slain? No. Am I saying run and jump at the opportunity to be stoned? Absolutely not. But you should live your life in a manner in such a way that you too could have a testimony like them that the world is not worthy to have you. You know what I mean? Live it in a manner and a way. Yeah, this death thing is deeper than what we understand. Even the life to come. You just you just have an idea like, oh, I'm going to heaven. But people don't even understand what that's going to be like. Right? Remember we talked about it last time, said, don't you know that there will be those who judge angels? Which, why would there even be a need to judge the angels? Which means there's more than what we understand. And we have to act, we have to continue to ask God, give us the spirit of understanding. Give us the spirit of wisdom that we can know you. But now you see that man dwells in different realms. Samuel was buried in the ground, but he was fully present with the mantle on coming up from out of the earth. It says Abraham was on one side. Abraham had Lazarus in his bosom that the angels delivered to him. The rich man was on the other side. The rich man was having a conversation with him. And then the rich man said, send the dead to go tell him. He said, man, if they wouldn't believe that, they don't stand a chance. But he didn't say it wasn't possible. So how often have you rejected something at the very nature that just think, oh, that's witchcraft or that's this. Am I saying just accept everything? No, you have to test everything. So I'm pro test, but I'm also pro receive what is from God. Amen. And I'm pro. I don't know everything. (laughs) Right. The one who assumes they know everything can receive nothing from God because you already know everything. Whereas me, I choose to err on the side of. Lord, I'm a sponge. I'll give. I'll take whatever you got. Let let me soak it in, right? So even in that, I understood that when the Lord Jesus taught me about heaven without the scriptures. But if I told you some experiences, I would never say them out loud on camera because people are like, oh, that's witchcraft, right? They they quickly crucify those things, and people don't even understand what happens. They don't even understand what happens when you die let alone what happens to people that have sicknesses and ailments in their body when they cross onto the life to come. Mm-hmm. Right? What happens? A man who gets marred and brutally torn in his body, what happens to that body when he crosses over? Right? What happens? Every man is renewed in light. Now I'm teaching you what I know. Every man is renewed in light. And every man has to pass through light. And in the passing through of light, Man is reconciled to what he always was, which is perfect. And that's what happens in heaven. Man passes through light and he is reconciled to what he always has been, which is perfect. That's how you're going to have bodies that are broken that are no longer broken. When you see people who passed away that were broken, they're not broken when you see them in the life to come. Even children. When we talk about the children and what happens to the children, there's a unique dynamics that happen with children. So even with the children, there are certain children, when they come in, if they have Godward thoughts, Godward thinking, meaning how they were already functioning and God brought them home, they will grow up and you will meet them. They won't be the same age that they were when they left. 
So you'll be taken back because they won't be the same age. But then there's other children that God will keep in that manner and they will go on to play and be taken care of. The idea of a nursery came from heaven. Heaven had the first nursery. <laughs> heaven had the first daycare. Right? That's what happens with the children. And the Lord taught me that, but then he gave me the scriptures to prove it. Even the word of God talks about how the children and their angels stand before them on their behalf before God. Let me see if I can find that. because Y'all know how that go with the internet. <laughs> I understood what Paul said, or Jesus says, I wish I could tell you spiritual things. But people will crucify you. I'm I'm having to hit the Google, you know. Matthew uh, 18. Here we go. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. This is Matthew 18, 10. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. See that? He said, take heed and do not despise these little ones. Because I tell you, their angels who are in heaven see the face of God, my father. When I tell you the children, there are certain angels that care for the children. And that's what happens. So when you see them, it's the loudest playground type of noise you'll ever hear. But it's the most bright and brilliant noise that you ever hear. When you hear the sound, you will perceive colors. That's how it is. I can't, even, I can't even explain it with words. You will hear the sound of the children, but your eyes will be flooded with color. I can't, I can't even figure out the way to put it in words that could express within our world what it's truly like. That's how I learned that the children grow up. Even the aborted babies. So you think, what happens when they abort a child? Because you know that this is mutilation is what happens. But that's when they brought the child. Well, of course, the body goes to the earth. But with those children, also are mature. But the dynamic is you'll see them and they will know you. And they will know what also happened to them. And there will be so much light. You will see them and there won't be the awareness of what you did as though you're being held accountable for it. There won't be the awareness for those who have committed abortions. You will see them and they will know who you are. Not in that manner. No, I can't speak to those because I'm not certain. Now I'm telling you of experiences that I know. So I can only speak definitively what I know. There are certain things I can speak definitively of and there are certain things that I can't. Definitively, I can tell you what I've experienced with the children. So definitively, my first encounter with an abortion was when my wife had an abortion. You understand? Yeah. And years later, the Lord allowed the curtain of heaven to be pulled back. He showed me, this is your daughter. This is her name. And this is what she looks like now. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't a small child. I'll tell the age at another time. I know the name and everything. And I, that's why I learned about that. The scriptures help me prove, not that I have to prove it. Because remember, Jesus said, hey, if I tell you earthly things you can't comprehend, how am I going to tell you heavenly things? <laughs> you don't even stand a chance, right? But that's why I learned about what happens to man when he crosses over. That's how I learned about the children. The children are matured, but they're matured into a way where they enjoy life. And they go on to enjoy a life of eternity knowing no sorrow, no pain, none of those things. They sleep, they play, they sleep, they play, they sleep, they learn some more, then they play. All of this is happening within the heavens. Remember Paul said, I know a man that was caught up in the paradise. But then I also know a man, can you find it for me? Type in paradise, it ain't but like three scriptures with paradise in it. <laughs> I'll look while you're looking too. Let 
Ah, qui doit. I got it. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in body, I do not know, or whether out of body, I do not know. God knows. Such a one was caught up into the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in body or out of body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for man to utter. So we see he was caught up into paradise and he was caught up into heaven. But I could tell you, most men, when they talk about heaven, you men who've been there know. That's kind of like we know we were listening to a gentleman who was sharing his testimony about heaven. He hadn't even spoken about it yet. He said a few phrases, just a few things through Instagram. And when I heard, and it was through text, it wasn't like he wrote, I mean, he wasn't like he was speaking, but he wrote a few things down. That was Apostle Jonathan Ferguson. And I don't know him personally, but when I heard, I said, that man's been to heaven. Because I understood the expression of what he wrote because I had seen it. And I said, that man's been there. And then shortly after the next day, he shared certain things. And I said, by golly, he sure has lined right up. There were other things that I learned that I just can't speak of. The reason I knew about the saints of old and how it's not witchcraft is because my first encounter with the angel of the Lord, he began to teach me certain things. He said, I've come to teach you. And he began to teach me about Elijah. I was, and I'm just in the moment in the experience. And as he taught me about Elijah, he also taught me, in the years to come, I'm going to come back and teach you other things. There'll be other ones who come and teach you also. And you will meet the saints of old also. And I knew that I would encounter Elijah. When I don't know. But I, as he taught me about it, like, there were things he taught me about Elijah that you can't read within the scriptures. That's how I understand men walk with secrets. There are certain things even concerning heaven that you'll never hear me discuss. Because the secret is a secret for a reason. Paul said it. I heard things that were unlawful to be expressed. Yet every man has a book about heaven telling you everything he encountered. <laughs> the, the 31 revelations of heaven. <laughs> right? Yet... Paul said, I was in paradise, and there were certain things that I could not speak about. Now, Paul encountered paradise after Jesus had resurrected. The paradise that Paul encountered was different from the paradise of Abraham's bosom, or the paradise when you talk about Jesus said, hey, tonight you were down with me in paradise. That paradise is within the heavens. That paradise is where the tree of life is. That paradise is where deep revelation comes from. That paradise is where the Lord God will bring individuals to teach them. That paradise is beautiful. Totally different paradise, you see. But if you can't receive earthly things, how can you receive spiritual things? Right? So there, you said there was paradise mentioned three different times, right? Mm -hmm. So are there three different types of paradise? No, not three different types of paradise. Only three accounts where it's mentioned. You had the account mentioned where... Samuel told him, hey, tonight you're going to come and dine with me. You had the account of Abraham, and then you also had, or Jesus, then you also have the account of Paul when he was caught up into paradise. Outside of there could be others who know better, but that's the only accounts that I know of. There could be others, but I, I'm not certain. But scripturally, from the scriptures, those are the three accounts. But I'm not willing to limit it to that also, because God can reach beyond my understanding of those 66 books. <laughs> right and the thing is you have to live in light of God that's why I always say it. Micah 7 and 7 says looking towards the Lord God you have to look towards the Lord God you have to look towards his day or the way Peter says it looking towards the day of the Lord hastening it not hastening as though we're ready but looking to it as though we desire to be with you I long for the fellowship that we once had in life that I don't not know remember Jeremiah he said before you were formed in your mother's womb, I already knew you, and I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. How could you know that which has not been formed? Which means the life that he was speaking about, Jeremiah had already encountered him, he just was unaware of it in this life. You see? So we have to desire to live before God, desire to be before him. That's what the man on the cross was about. He was not aggressive towards God. 
he did not have angst towards him. When he says, seeing as though we're under the same condemnation, God says, good heart, today you will be me a paradise. But the other one with his vile and his anger and his ugh, God says, you know where you're going. <laughs> right? But you have to desire to be with him. You have to desire to look towards him. You have to desire. I'm telling you now, if Jesus is not to go, the world will swallow you up and you won't even see it coming. We want to take many souls to heaven. But if Jesus is not your desire, the world will quickly gain your attention and your affections. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? It profits him nothing. It profits him eternal damnation. But if you don't live in light of the one who saved you. Now, the one who dies, you know, when it talks about, hey, the one who comes at the end, he reaps the same wages. God is, can pay who he pays, that whole thing. That's fine for that guy who dies on his deathbed in that manner. But you and I, we know better. You and I know better. So we don't get to live as though, oh, at the end, we're just going to just snap our fingers and make this right. God is full of mercy, full of grace, full of compassion. But we have to look towards him. Looking to his day. And I'm telling you, if you don't look towards his day, the world will swallow you whole. You don't feel like it now. But with enough cares of life, with enough strife, with enough struggle, with enough pain, the world will swallow you whole and you will find yourself eternally separated from your maker and your creator. And then you will have the same sentiments like that rich man. Please dip your finger in the water and cool my tongue because I'm tormented in this flame. And most people, they can't imagine it happening to them. The fact that you can't imagine it lets me know it could happen to you. I live in light of being separated from because I never want to be. You understand? You have to live in light of the one who saved you. It's about him. If your desire is not to be with him, what's keeping you from not going to be with him? The world will quickly gather your affections and you will look up and find yourself drowning in a sea of sin and find yourself away from the mercies of God. But God is able to keep us. That's why he says, now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless unto the only wise God. God is able to keep us, but we too have to keep ourselves also. You know what I mean? And we have to look towards the day of the Lord. That's why you always say, man, just look to God. You always hear, you listen to my conversation with individuals, man, just look to God. You hear me ministering to people, just look to God. Because if you look to him, you'll behold him and you will desire him. And when a man desires him, he won't let nothing get in the way. But even in that, there's so much in the life to come. I'll tell you more about heaven, but I, you, know, you don't want to put too much on somebody's head. <laughs> and, you, and your head just explode. <laughs> right? Then you're just trying to like <laughs> keep trying to keep your composure. But there's so much more than what we understand about the life to come. You know, people say, oh, man, you're going to be before heaven. You're going to do this you do that. There's people that sleep in heaven. You didn't know that. They will go into the house and it'll be time for sleep. And then they'll come out and do other things. There's people that work in heaven. There's so many different facets that aren't written expressly within the scriptures that are existing. So many facets. So many facets. Well beyond what we understand. You just thought you were just going to stand there and just... <laughs> That's how you were taught. You were taught from people who don't know God. Which is a part. Which is which is, it is a part of it. But there is more. There is more. Remember, heaven is for a period. We'll be coming back here. We're looking for the new Jerusalem. The city not made with human hands. Wherein righteousness dwells. That's how I learned about the Lamb of God in the city to come. And the world to come. <laughs> Excuse me. That's how I learned about it. One of my encounters with the Lord Jesus, he did not say anything. However, in his light and his brilliance, there were so many words that he would speak. So he did not speak as though you and I speak, I'm speaking to you now. But within his speech, there was light. 
I was sharing this with your mother. It was even just like, oh, what? Just <laughs> it was a a mind renewal, and I did not know the scriptures at the time, and I knew that the Lamb of God would speak and it would be light, and light would flow from him. And then later, the Lord taught me the scriptures. This is what you experience with me is how you prove it here. Mm-hmm. And that day, the Lamb will be the light. And it says that in Revelations when it talks about the Lamb of God and how he will be the light. And I had a correlation for what I had experienced. But there's so much more than what we understand. So, of course, everyone's been taught. You're going to go here. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. You're going to do that, which is good. We're not discounting that. But even in that, most of that is just anchored in just what you know. And what that's good. But God has so much more for us. And it's about knowing him. It's about being with him. Because that right there isn't enough to keep somebody. That right there is not. Will it keep people? Yes. Has it kept people? Yes. But is it enough? No. You have to desire him. When your desire is to be with him and never be separated from him, there won't be anything that could ever get in the way. And that has to be the desire. That has to be the goal. Amen? Excellent. So let's cut that off. And you can flip the screen, sir. And y'all bear with us because we got new technology. We got the best technology, but we're learning how to use it. Right? Because we want to give God our best. We're not interested in giving him our worst. <laughs> right? So then um, this is what we're going to do. Anita and Joe, we spoke this week. Thank you.